This is why I don't venture into the deep woods. Devin was 14, turning 15 on December 29th, and right around when this story happened. Devin, a young teenager, had lived with his family on a farm outside of Chickasha, Oklahoma. And they're right at a position where they could actually see the Chickasha airport from their house. Devin's home life is pretty normal, but also fairly boring including a bunch of regular mundane chores he has to do that includes gathering any trash in the yard or field or one or two of the houses. And like any normal teenager, it is then his duty to take the trash down all the way towards the end of the driveway, which is roughly about a quarter mile or so long. So Devin's experience centers around this really creepy driveway. So it's November, it's nighttime, and Devin's mom had put something in the trash that she is hounding Devin, you need to go take this down to the end of the driveway now. It cannot wait. And at the very end of their driveway, they had a dumpster in which they would go and put their trash in to wait for the trash to be picked up on whatever day they would have a trash pickup service come. Well, Devin grabs his phone, which like most of us has a very bright flashlight app on it, which he used to illuminate his way down to the end of the driveway while taking out the trash. And of course, with him on this wonderful journey was this trash bag that weighed roughly 60 pounds, as he described it, probably exaggerating. Now, it was up to this point that Devin had never actually taken out the trash at night since they'd only been living here for probably about three or so months. And so Devin looks down the end of the driveway, but he couldn't see the other end. The trees that go down the driveway just kind of seem to consume all the light and the moon being barely visible in the crisp autumn sky. It wasn't giving off a whole lot of light. And so it just made for a really dark and eerie trip down the driveway. Devin, knowing what he had to do, shrugged his shoulders and began walking down the driveway and instantly noticed that his phone's flashlight was not enough because in fact it was so dark that he could barely see 10 feet in front of him. This was almost like consuming darkness. But Devin decided to press on and all was fine, or so he says, until he gets to the middle of the driveway. And this is when things take a cliff dive real fast. Immediately, he hears a voice of a friend who had recently moved away saying hello from the field directly to his left. He instantly stops and freezes, and he turns and he shines his light over into the field, looking and sees nothing except two feet tall dry grass. A little unnerved and shaken up, he's just convinced that he just somehow heard it in his head, and is like, you know what, I gotta take this trash down. I'm just gonna continue on my merry way. And so he keeps going down the driveway, but still listening very, very intently. He's looking around, he's checking his surroundings, making sure there's no noise, and he gets to about three fourths quarter down the driveway and he has heard so many different voices coming from all around the field all around him at once. Voices he had recognized were his other friends, his dad, whom he doesn't live with anymore and hadn't for a while, one of his friend's little sister and Devin's own voice at five years old. To him, they were saying his name, Devin, Devin, and things he could not understand. Now with everything we know so far, we might assume that Devin is having a psychotic break or some sort of schizophrenic episode, but it gets crazier. They sounded as if they were coming with the wind and not from a specific area around him. So he keeps pressing on, terrified now at this point, he gets to the end of the driveway and stops. And he throws the bag in the dumpster, looking into the field for anything, for any signs of this noise, but sees absolutely nothing. No movement, no sign that anybody's there trying to prank him. And for a moment, he thinks about maybe calling or texting somebody to tell them to come to the end of the driveway with a car but then thinks about it again and decides against it. Now that he thinks about it, Devin was not thinking clearly at all. His senses heightened, he was nervous, he was scared, but he decided that his only real course of action was to walk back down the driveway because he thought that if it were an animal or something, that it would chase him if he ran. So bravely, he began to walk back just listening and try and remain as calm as possible and the voices started again as soon as he entered the driveway again, saying words like hi, time, and go. At least that's what Devin could make out, and all these voices spoke in a chorus all at once. Devin, completely unnerved and frightened by this ever-continuing experience, continues to walk faster back down the driveway, trying to get back home as quick as he can, and then it changes. He now hears the sound of footsteps in the grass coming toward him. And this whole time, he had not looked back to the grass just because he was too scared to find out what was actually there and had only ever looked back to the house. And so finally, Devin musters up the courage somehow to finally look back 
at what his possible pursuer was, and he sees this tall black shape as the light didn't fully illuminate what it was or show any features of whatever it was, but he could see that it was lurching there in the grass following him. And he immediately could make out that it was at least seven plus feet tall from what he could tell and had these long arms pressed against its sides and it was kind of hunched over slightly. At this point, Devin was done. He turns around and he starts running all the way back to his place and immediately noticed that the air was somehow more cold than it was. It is a November night, so the air is already going to be crisp and cool, but something had changed within seconds. Devin hears a second set of feet hitting the gravel coming right behind him. Although it clearly sounded like whatever it was was just jogging after him, but it seemed to catch up to him very quickly as the sound of the gravel being crunched down under weighted feet grew louder and louder. Devin manages to bust in the front yard, took off, runs around the house, jumping over the truck frame in the back carport and into the back door finally. So now he's sitting there for a moment, terrified, <laughs> Thinking whatever this thing was followed him home, it is now outside after just a two minute walk. After he's able to compose himself, he gets up from the door, walks to his room where his brothers and sisters are in the room playing video games, and asks them, did you hear anything? But they informed Devin they simply did not hear anything. Even when Devin told them about the voices he had heard and tells them about the figure that he had just saw, they get mad at Devin to tell him to stop making stuff up. So Devin shuts down and just kind of only talks about the voices he heard. In the meantime, he tried to do some research and concluded that it could have been a skinwalker though, but he's not entirely sure. Not too long after this event, maybe within a couple of weeks, Devin had one of his friends over and his sister, telling them in details about the voices he had heard, but never telling them that it was his sister's voice he had heard that night. And kind of like the taking out the trash story, for whatever reason, Devin, friend, and his sister were deciding to go down the driveway to the very end to see if anything would happen. Bad idea, right? So Devin talks to his oldest brother into going with them, and they picked up a couple weapons just in case. Uh, they had a couple of pocket knives, a pipe, Devin's machete, which he now brings with him anytime he has to take the trash out at night. And so they all go out there right at the carport, and they're looking down the driveway. And the first test they want to do is if does this dark driveway really consume light, which it did. And they all agreed and were kind of disturbed by how little light the driveway provided. Devin and his older brother have the same kind of phone and the same kind of flashlight on the phone. While Devin's sister had her phone light and a separate flashlight. And with all of that light pointed down the driveway, they could still barely see 10 feet in front of them. And so now they start walking as a unit down the driveway, talking, but still very on edge of everything around them. The night was quiet and it just felt eerie, like something could go wrong at any given moment. And as they're walking, Devin begins to tell them more details about his previous experience, saying, you know, there's a few details I left out. And he tells them about where he had heard each voice. And when the wind picked up, how he saw a figure in the field and how the air was somehow even colder than what it was, but still leaving out the part where Devin was chased. And so finally, Devin and crew get to the end of the driveway without any real issues. And this is when Devin's friend started to be a total jerk to his sister, trying to make her run back home. So Devin and his brother are trying to get his friend to stop. And at some point during this whole fiasco, they all thought they saw a figure at the end of the road, but in the blink of an eye, it was gone. But they all swear they saw a shadow. Now, almost halfway between the end of the road and the driveway, the sister begins walking back because she has had enough at this point. And she's still very young too. At this time, she had just turned 12, only equipped with a measly pocket knife. And so she was not about what was going on. So she started to bail and Devin basically told his friend off and decided to go run up and catch up with the sister to try and walk her back and keep her safe. As Devin catches up to her to walk her back and try and comfort her and soothe her, they get lost in conversation. She confides some very personal information with Devin and they make it back to the house just fine. But when him and the sister go to the room and start playing games and kind of get lost in conversation, after what seemed like an hour, Devin's older brother and friend came in and were kind of freaking out, saying, how long have you been in here? Devin informed his brother and friend that after about eight or so minutes of being back at the house, they decided to play games where his older brother and friend decided to turn back and walk back down the driveway again, where they supposedly saw this figure walking from the field across from the driveway to where a large fence is where it actually walked over the fence. 
That's when they began running, and when they got to the end of the driveway, saw nothing looking down it. Completely freaked out, and unsure of why they decided to run back down the driveway towards the end after seeing this figure is completely unknown to Devin, but they eventually made it back, completely terrified, and are convinced that there is some sort of spiritual humanoid creature stalking in and around their house. Gabriel was in his backyard that was a good three or so acres until it hits a dense forest. This was roughly about six or so in the afternoon, and Gabriel was sitting relaxing on the porch swing in near 50 degree weather with his two dogs. It was all pretty normal until or so about two hours later when suddenly their ears had perked up and they began staring intently in the forest. Their posture was low and they had that look of seeing something they did not like. This occurred for probably around 30 seconds until they bolted at the forest. Gabriel thought it was the smell of rabbit that they caught. That was until the barking was dwarfed by some demonic scream or shriek, as Gabriel describes it. He jumps to his attention, his blood running cold, and the barking of his dogs turns to sharp yelps. Thinking fast and knowing that they were dangerous animals in the area, such as coyotes, wolves, bears, etc., he grabs a hatchet that was located on a pile of logs, a flashlight, and put his iPhone on vertically facing the forest and pressing record. And he did this more as an afterthought. He sprints to the forest, hoping that he was in time, and not just a second when he got to the edge, his dogs bolt back to the house, yelping and whimpering as they went. And then everything goes dead silent. And Gabriel means dead. The way he described it is as if every living creature around him just all died at once. Being prodded by curiosity, Gabriel was only about 20 or so feet into the forest when he felt that gut feeling of something following him. He then stopped to test that theory, and to his sheer horror, the sounds of heavy footsteps stopped a split second after Gabriel's. He was shaking like a leaf at this point and did not move for about two minutes until these footsteps began moving, but going around him this time. Judging by the sheer crunching of the leaves and twigs and branches, he originally thought this had to have been a bear at least. And then they stopped abruptly in front of Gabriel. What he did next was something he had hated himself doing up to this day. He turns his flashlight on and it moved in front of him. And there this thing was, this thing, it was easily eight feet tall with bone white skin that was so stretched on the body frame it looked like the slightest movement would split it open. He described it as being humanoid in appearance that was except for its abnormally long arms and unnatural looking face. Its head was human-like, but its eyes were completely void and gone, leaving just soulless sockets, and its lower jaw was split in two and connected by muscle. He watched in horror as the thing's lower jaw would split open, then close back, making this bony click. The thing was, he didn't know if it was staring at him, but if you could say that it could see him without eyes, he would. Gabriel didn't know if it actually knew he was there or not, until about several seconds later. It spastically moved its head to the left as if hearing something. Gabriel steps backwards and a loud crack of a branch emanated from beneath him. He looks down to see a branch now split in two beneath his feet. When he looks up again, the thing's head was looking right in his direction. And what he described as buckets of saliva oozing from its maw as its skeletal face glared at him. He yelps involuntarily, and the thing let out a long, ear-piercing scream as its lower jaw stretched out left and right. He doesn't even remember what happened next, but just as soon as he sprinted back to the safety of his house, only hearing the heavy footsteps right behind him. He gets back to the house with all of his breath gone, and subtly remembers that his phone was recording. He looks back to the forest to see if it was following him, but to his surprise, the thing was not there. It must have stopped following him when he had reached the border of the forest. He gave himself the small comfort that it was probably his imagination that was until he saw his dogs. His husky had a gash on its back and on his Shiba Inu. This was not his imagination. Now, this wasn't a Wendigo, he's convinced, because there would have been a foul odor and other assets along with it, he described. A skinwalker? No, 
He doesn't believe that either. He's not sure what that thing was, but he believes that it was definitely supernatural in nature. Callan, who resides in South Africa, has some pretty bizarre experiences with what he describes as a creature dog thing. At the time of this happening, this was right around 2011, 2012, when Callan was right around eight or nine years old. And he claims that due to an almost non-existent imagination, there was no delusion to be added to this account. Callan and his father went to a classic car run about one or so years before he had passed away. Callan and his father had a fun time until Callan had heard two gunshots and he immediately sees his father get up and fall into the hall where almost everybody was sitting for dinner. That was the only time he had ever seen his father shoot away from a gun range and he wanted to know what had happened, but his father would not tell him. He told him that he should not worry too much and not stay out late. Callan went on and thought that someone most likely tried to steal one of the cars, and when they were done eating and heading back to the bungalow, he had recognized that his father was going to the back of the bungalow and not the front where they usually did. He had asked his father about this, and his reply was, Son, this is closer to the bedroom, and I'm a bit tired. Then he changed his facial expression to something more nervous. As Callan was a smaller child, he had decided to not ask why he was nervous, and he never slept that night. The next day, before they went home, he decided to have a high, thick wall built around their home. Before he had gone home, he saw huge prints the size of his father's hands, but... The prints were those of a dog on its back legs, and he noticed the two bullet casings on the floor in front of a pool of blood that did not belong to his father. Callan looks at his father, and he uttered a single sentence with one word that he never understood until around a week or so ago, and he said it was a Chelovic Sobaka. Callan, not understanding what this was, he had searched for the word and found that it meant dogman in Russian. Backtracking a bit, apparently Callan's dad was very involved in the military, was an expert marksman, great in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and had dealt with the Russians before. So now that 10 years have pretty much passed at this point, Callan enlisted the help of a local man, whom he referred to as Chris, to help find out what his father meant. Chris explained to Callan that he had documentation since he had worked with Callan's father that had talked about an encounter Callan's father had on a military base in Russia. Now, around four or so weeks later, Callan and his father were supposed to be at a dig site. On their way back home, they passed a man-made dam around one kilometer away from the dam. Callan's father seemed nervous again, and he had the same look on his face that he had that night when he had fired his gun. And he again heard him uttering the words, Chelovic Sobaka. And he looks in the direction that his father's looking, and he sees this two and a half to three meter tall dog thing on its back legs next to a light post, as if it had wanted them to see it there. And Callan goes on to show the utmost confidence in his height estimate because the top of its head was halfway up the light post and they're around seven meters tall. After Callan and his father are both looking at this thing, Callan can confidently say that his father was genuinely afraid for his life. Now again, Callan's father is a military man, a very hardy individual who's dealt with hand-to-hand -hand combat. He is a sniper. He has seen his fair share of violence and bloodshed. And for this man to be terrified is beyond what Callan can process. The next story that Callan has shared is more recent and that he claims that he keeps seeing black suburbans around his area. First and foremost, black suburbans are not necessarily a vehicle you see in South Africa as Cadillacs are too difficult to ship into South Africa. I mean, it is possible, but it's more difficult and costly. And so Callan goes on a walk this night to a local shop that's around 700 or so meters away from the home, and he remembers that he had smelt something like sewage and begins to hear dogs barking and yelping and running home. And when he looks back, he sees this dog-like thing again, but closer, and can make out that it had the body of a man with the head of a wild canine or a German shepherd as he described it. And he hears it say this in a voice that he had recognized but can't figure out why or what. And it said these exact words to him. Careful, my dear child. Careful of the Chelovic Sobaka. Then, as suddenly as he could see it, it was gone in a puff of smoke. He doesn't know what he saw, but it sounds like a wolf man, but also having the characteristics of a skinwalker. He had also found prints of a huge dog thing in their yard, but they don't have a dog and they're afraid of getting one. He truly has no idea what this was or how to rationally explain it, but whatever it is, whatever resides in South Africa, 
is supposedly the same cryptid or creature that resides in the rest of the world, haunting people. What do you guys think? Is there truly a bipedal set of creatures stalking and haunting the woods all around the world, or are these merely creepypasta fictions written to entertain the masses? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I would love to know your opinions. Also, don't forget to go ahead and smack that like button, hit that big ol' red subscribe button, and keep your notifications turned on because it helps out my channel tremendously. As always, guys, I will see you all in the very next episode.